Kia ora tato. Um, we have spent the last few videos learning about linear systems. We've learnt what they are, we've learnt how we can solve them using Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan elimination, and we're getting quite comfortable with the operations that we need to do to actually do this. So what we're going to do in this video and in the next one is explore a couple of applications of these that might not be things that you necessarily have thought about before. Um, so in this video, we're going to look at finding the temperature distribution through an object that has different temperatures at its boundaries. Okay, so the particular example I'm going to use is based on one I found in a book by Anton called Elementary Linear Algebra, but this is a very common application of linear systems. Okay, so what's our setup? Now we're going to take a really simplified model of a dam that has a trapezoidal cross section, so they're basically just that shape there. So for simplicity, we're going to dream up some slightly non-realistic temperature scenarios. We're going to assume that the water temperature is zero degrees, so it's basically on the verge of freezing, but it's still water. The ground temperature is zero, uh, sorry, is 10 degrees, um, and that the air temperature is 20. Okay, obviously we could make up some other numbers, but maybe you could dream up a weather scenario that might result in these slightly strange conditions. We're also going to assume the water temperature is um, zero degrees throughout. It's not going to be different temperatures, different places. Okay, so we've got our totally non-realistic weather set up, but it will do for now. So what we want to know is how is the temperature spread or distributed throughout this cross section so that we can understand perhaps the thermal stresses that might be on the material. Okay, so a, a gradient in temperature can cause some interesting material properties. So it turns out that if we were to draw a small circle around a point P in our cross section, that the temperature at P is the average value of the temperature inside the circle. So on the face of it, this doesn't make solving the problem any easier, but the insight we're going to use is we're going to instead look for the temperature on a grid that we overlay on the cross section. So maybe at this point we can start to get a bit of an inkling as to how to approach it. So we could overlay a grid in a number of different ways. So here, for example, are three with successively finer, what we call mesh spacings. And then on the boundaries, the outside of it, we can specify the temperature to, being the, to be the corresponding fixed boundary temperature. And what we're after is the interior temperatures. Okay, now this average value property that I just talked about can also be stated approximately on a grid as what's called the discrete mean value property, which says that at each interior mesh point, the temperature at that point is simply the average of the temperature at its four neighboring mesh points. So we, so we should expect that our approximation should get better as our grid or our mesh gets finer. So let's start with the first case where there's only one mesh point to solve for. Um, so the discrete mean value property would tell us therefore that T naught would be one quarter, we're taking an average of the surrounding temperatures which are 20, 10, 0 and 0, so that's a quarter of 30 which gives us 7.5 degrees there. Okay, so that's our warm up. Let's move now to our second case where we have nine interior mesh points. So we'll need to write down this average value property for every single one. So you can see at the first one, we have T1 is going to be one quarter. I'm just going to go in the north, east, north, east, south, west direction each time to hopefully make it clear. I'm going to have a quarter of 0 plus 0 plus T2 plus 20. That will be T1. Then T2 will be a quarter of T1 plus T3 plus T4 plus 20. Then T3 will be a quarter of 0 plus 0 plus T5 plus T2. Then T4 will be a quarter of T2 plus T5 plus T7 plus 20. T5 will be a quarter of T3 plus T6 plus T8 plus T4. We get in there. T6 will be a quarter of 0 plus 0 plus T9 plus T5. And then T7 will be a quarter of T4 plus T8 plus 10 plus 20. Two more. T8 will be a quarter of T5 plus T9 plus 10 plus T7. And then finally, this will give us T9 as a quarter of T6 plus 0 plus 10 plus T8. 
Okay, let's just take a breather for a second. So what we have here, if we were to rearrange these slightly, each one of these equations is a linear equation in some of the t's. So if we rearrange them to put all of the t's on the left and all of the numbers on the right, that will give us nine equations, the first of which will be t1 minus a quarter t2 equals five. You see I've just multiplied out that quarter and then just rearranged it so the five is left on the right and everything else is left on the left. The next one will be negative a quarter t1 plus t2 minus a quarter t3 minus a quarter t4 will equal 5. So you can see that the t2 has a 1 in front of it and everything else has a negative quarter. And then we have a quarter of whatever the numbers were on the right. So we can continue on in this way. And we end up with nine equations, all of the same kind of format that relate these things together. Okay, so the next step would be to write this equation down as a nice big augmented matrix. So it's going to be, I guess we just go row by row and figure it out. So the first row, I've got a one for T1. I have a negative a quarter for T2, and I have zeros for everything else. So it's gonna be that matrix times the vector T1 through to T9. It's going to equal the vector, and the first entry is going to be five. I then look at my second equation, and I'll get negative a quarter for the T1 entry, one for the T2 entry, negative a quarter for the T3 entry, negative a quarter for the T4 entry, zeros for everything else, and then it's gonna be a right-hand side of five again. So I continue on along those lines and fill up the whole thing. A couple of things that, are, that we note, all of the diagonal entries, that's the one, the one, one, the two, two, the three, three, they're all ones. So we've got this sort of diagonal of ones going down the middle of our matrix and everything that's off that diagonal should be negative a quarter. And then the right hand sides are 5, 5, 0, 5, 0, 0, 7.5, 2.5 and 2.5. So it's a quarter of whatever we had in our first set of equations for the number part. Okay, so now we have a, a nine by nine matrix A. We have a vector T that we want to solve for. And we have a vector B with nine entries that forms our right hand side. Now I have absolutely zero desire to try and work this one out by hand. Uh, it's a little bit big. We could, but life's too short. So what we want to do is we're going to practice um, using Octave to solve this one. So we're going to enter it in there and we'll let it solve it for us. So I'm going to bring up Octave and I want to save my commands this time in a file so that I can come back and use them again later because it'll be a shame to type all this stuff in only to have to retype it in next time I want to solve the problem. So I'll start by creating a new file. So next I'm going to type in the matrix A. So I'll start off by just typing it in as all zeros, and then I'll go through and delete and fill in entries as I go. So as we just mentioned, we have ones down that main diagonal. So let's go through and replace all of those diagonal zeros with ones. Now it's just a case of very carefully going through and replacing all of the relevant zeros with negative 0.25s. Okay, so let's just get those all in there. Okay, now I think I've got all of these in. So I'm going to get Octave to find the RREF of A first. Now why do I want to do that? I just want to check that my matrix, that my system does actually have a unique solution. So notice, it's, remember it's not an augmented matrix. So what I should do, what I should get when I do reduced ratio on form of it is just a matrix with all ones on the diagonals and zeros elsewhere. So my A is not an augmented matrix, so there won't be any right hand sides in this version of it. I'm only doing this to check that I actually have unique solution, um, that there are no zero rows at the bottom or anything weird like that. So let's just type in RREF of A and see what we get. And then I'll use the command A backslash B to solve the system for us. So this is kind of the standard command for solving a, a square linear system like this, where the coefficient matrix is square and it gives us an answer. Okay, um, so a little note on that command also, we, sh we need to be confident that what that our, our system does actually have a unique solution before we use this command because 
This command is multi-purpose and it actually gives us results even if our matrix is not invertible, or sorry, if our, if our system does not have a unique solution. And exactly what those means, what those different results mean, we're not going to cover in this course, but it's worth being aware that they have meaning and we need to understand a bit about our system first, in particular for us that it has a unique solution. Okay, so let's save it and run and see what happens. So I'll switch over to the command window and I can see that my T vector is 7.846, 11 11.3834.7197, 7.491, 12.967, 7.4919, 3.265, 12.995, 9.014, and 5.570. So let's go ahead and draw this on our diagram. And look, it seems to make some degree of sense. If we just look at the boundaries and the interior values, those numbers seem to kind of fit with what we might expect to see here. Okay, now we could go ahead and repeat this for our finer mesh, but to attack this, we would probably want to invent some kind of way of building the matrix automatically, because we're already sort of nearing the limit of what we can reliably manually type in. So I won't do this in, the, in this video, but those of you with some computer programming experience, maybe you want to go ahead and try this out as a programming challenge. <sighs> okay, the, the point is, um, <laughs> apart from an insect in my mouth, the point is that the computer is able to do the heavy lifting of solving the system for us, and we can in principle solve this system for whatever shape or number of, um, whatever shape of object or whatever number of mesh points that we like. Um, so note this is also our first example of a system where we had some genuine reason to use more than three variables. It kind of naturally comes out of the setup of the problem. It's not just all about the geometry of vectors in 2D and 3D. So, hope, okay, so hopefully this video broadened your perspective a little bit on what systems of equations can be used for. Um, there's plenty more to say about problems like this one, like how accurate is our answer and how fine does my mesh need to be and all that kind of thing, but we'll save that for another course. So we'll call it a day for this one, and we'll see you in the next video. Kakite anō.